Okay, Boker Tov. So we've been studying the Amidah, going through the Berachot. We're in the third section of the Amidah, the section of Hoda'ah. But we paused to detail the procedure of Birkat Kohanim. After the Beracha of Modim, Hatov Shimcha Ulchana Ele Hodot, we then in the Hazara of the Amidah perform Birkat Kohanim. So we already did one class detailing the uh, precursor to Birkat Kohanim, how the Kohanim wash their hands and when it's required and when it's uh, uh, a stringency. We also talked about removing shoes and why some do and why some don't and ascending the platform and not. These are all things that we do as we're preparing for Birkat Kohanim. The Hazan will continue the Amidah, his, the repetition of the Amidah, as the Kohanim make themselves ready for, uh, for the Beracha. And then uh, they'll get to Modim. The Hazan will say Modim, the Kahal will say Modim de Rabbanan. At the conclusion of Modim de Rabbanan, the Kohanim will insert a prayer before the Hazan reaches the Beracha and they're ready to do um, and they're ready to do Birkat Kohanim. So you'll see uh, many Kohanim have it on those little cards that we put right at the, right at the dais. There's a special prayer that Kohanim say before they, they do Birkat Kohanim. The Beracha goes as follows. It should be your will. Hashem avotenu, the Lord our God and the God of our forefathers. That the following Beracha that you have commanded us. To bless your nation Israel. Beracha Shelema should be a complete and full blessing. There shouldn't be any, uh, any issue, any impediment or sin. For here and for all eternity. Hindrance. A hindrance, exactly, right? An obstacle. In other words, the Kohanim are saying that they don't take this responsibility of blessing the people lightly. It is a, a major responsibility and burden. And that we are preempting the Beracha by saying Hashem should accept the Beracha. He should make the Kohanim a respectable conduit for this Beracha. And that perhaps any transgressions that the Kohanim themselves had should not stand as a barrier between the Beracha that Hashem wishes to bestow on the people. So, you know, Kohanim, we all, everybody does things wrong. And so there's a possibility, by the way, that people could say, oh, this guy's going to bless me, this Kohanim's going to bless me, he does this, he does that, you know, why should he be the one to bless? And so, A, we ask Hashem not to allow people to say such things, that's number one. But also, number two, that, that's a pretty valid claim, right? And so therefore, Kohanim say, Hashem, overlook whatever personal things that I have done so that the Beracha can flow through me towards B'nai Israel. Now, the Halakha stipulates that a Kohen should try, as best as possible, to elongate this prayer, to say it slowly, so that by the time he finishes this prayer, the Hazan completes the Beracha of Hatov Shimcha Ulchana Ele Hodot, so that the Kaha will answer Amen, and the Amen that they say will go to both the Beracha of the Hazan as well as the prayer of the Kohanim. Right? Right so, this is, but it, right, so this is what a person should attempt to do. Sometimes the Hazan might be taking a little bit of time, or the person might not be mindful of it, and they finish it early. So be it. It's not the end of the world. But ideally speaking, the Kohen should try and time out and, res- and say this prayer slowly to finish simultaneously with the Hazan, so that the Amen could go on both of those, uh, both of those prayers. And from there, they'll flow now into we'll Birkat Kohanim. The, the Kohanim. We'll get to that, yes. Does right? He have, does he have to say that? Does he have to say he's still fulfilling the mitzvah? He still fulfills the mitzvah, but it's an important prayer to say. I think it puts the Kohen in the proper frame of mind, and it's brought down in Halakha that they should recite uh, this prayer. Yes. Any other questions about this opportunity, this, uh, this statement? Okay, good. What, what do they prepare the Kohanim to go off? When? Well, from Retze already, you hear people say, Kohanim Bechavod. Already by that point, the Kohanim are making their way right. towards the platform. Right. They're standing up there. Then, the, then the, you have the Modim. They say Modim de Rabbanan. And then from the time that the, Kohen, that the Hazan is saying, at the, concludes his Modim till the Beracha, that's when the Kohen should insert this prayer. Now, at this point, the Kohanim are standing with their backs to the Kahal. So now, the Beracha of Birkat Kohanim is going to get underway. The Kohanim will place their talet over their heads, covering their face and their hands as well. We said that this was a relatively newer practice, that at one point in time, the Kohanim simply blessed the people without putting any sort of covering on them. That's why we said deformities in the Kohanim's hands or face was problematic because people would stare at it instead of concentrating on the Beracha. That was a problem. 
Nowadays, we have the practice that uh, Maran in the Bet Yosef says he already viewed in Egypt when he spent a couple of years right. there, uh, that they were placing their talent over their right. hands and head um, when performing Birkat Kohanim. So the Kohanim will drape the talent over their head, at which point the Hazan will prompt them to begin the, the blessing by calling to them the word Kohanim. And this is assuming that there are multiple Kohanim. If there are more than one Kohen, then the Chazam will call to them, or maybe even a side person will call to them, to prompt them to begin the Beracha. The reason for the prompting, and the reason for the back and forth, 1-1, one, one, uh, how procedure of Kohanim is going to work, is because in the Beracha it says that when Hashem commanded Aharon, the Be'er Aharon ve'el banav lemor, ko et b'nei Yisrael, amor lahem, say to them, so the rabbis take those words, Amor lahem, that somebody else who's not a Kohen, who's not among them, should prompt the Kohanim in reciting the Beracha. That's what they learned from those words. Yeah? Also, there's an idea that because Amor lahem, it's told to them in the plural, there's an idea that Birkat Kohanim is only a mitzvah de oraita when there's more than one Kohen, because you see that everything is brought down in the plural. Hence, there are some slight changes <coughs> when there's only one Kohen present in the Bet Knesset. But assuming there's more than one Kohen, the Hazan or a side caller will call to them Kohanim. That will prompt the Kohanim to begin the Beracha. How, how come when I was in Israel, the, uh, the, the Kohanim was saying Yibarech Echa? I mean, we weren't saying... Good. So there, I'll get to that in a moment. There are different practices about what to do with that first word of Yibarech Echa. So if there's only one Kohen, so then the Hazan does not prompt them with the word Kohanim. Really, the Kohen, whoever it is, will just begin the Beracha on his own. However, because sometimes the Kohen is waiting for somebody to trigger him to say the Beracha, even when he's solo, but you can't call Kohanim, because Kohanim is in the plural, there's only one Kohen, a custom developed for somebody to call him the word Amor, Emor, say, right? To still prompt the, the Kohen, if there's only one, to say the Beracha. This is an acceptable custom. However, it's important to note that the Hazan should not be the one to do that. So if you have only one Kohen, and somebody is going to prompt the one Kohen to begin the Beracha by saying Emor, it should not be the, the Hazan himself. It should be a side person. Why? Because the calling of Kohanim was an institution by the rabbis is acceptable for the Hazan while he's in his repetition of the Amidah to call to the Kohanim. However, this custom of saying emor to one Kohen is a custom that we developed. It was not instituted by the rabbis. If the Hazan were to say that, it would be considered a hefsek, an interruption of his repetition of the Amidah. Hence, we'll have a side person come in and say emor, and then the, the Beracha can continue from that point on. Yes? Good. Correct. So if a Kohen is the Hazan, he does not partake of Birkat Kohanim in general. The reason, because, the reason is, the Mishnah says, because of Teruf. He could become uh, you know, disoriented if he's, again, they didn't have Sidurim in those days and everything had to be done you know, by heart. So we're nervous that if the Hazan participates in Birkat Kohanim, he will be disoriented and won't be able to return back to the Amidah to complete the Birkat Kohanim. So that's why typically a Kohen Hazan does not participate in Birkat Kohanim. The exception to that rule is... If the Hazan is a Kohen, we do not let the Hazan participate in Birkat Kohanim because when he finishes Birkat Kohanim, we're afraid he'll be disoriented to continue the repetition of the Amidah of Sim Shalom to the end. He'll forget where his placement is and as a result, he'll, it'll, his, the rest of his repetition will be deficient. So we rather, the Kohen remain silent, listen to the Beracha, have his mind focused on Sim Shalom, and continue the Amidah, his repetition properly. Now, the only exception to that is, if the Hazan is the only Kohen present in the Bet Knesset, and he is confident, which most people are today, especially with the advent of Sidurim, that he can continue the, the repetition of the Amidah, post the Birkat Kohanim properly, that then the Kohen can perform, the Hazan who's a Kohen, can perform Birkat Kohanim, so we don't lose the opportunity to perform Birkat Kohanim. So he turns around? Exactly. So what will happen is, I actually had to do this, I, I, my, one of my first jobs that I had as a rabbi, I was uh, 21 years old, I ran the 5.30 a.m. minyan in Bet Torah, like the graveyard. So it was like, 
95 year old men and like people who really needed to get to work, right? Those are the two uh, part- participants in this, uh, in this thing, right? The 95 year old men were in the shul from like 2.30 in the morning. But by the time I got there, I'm like strolling in like half thing. They're like, Rabbi, why are you so tired for? Like, so I'm like, because I'm 21, we're not supposed to be up at this hour. We prayed I'd beat 20 minutes ago. <laughs> okay, so, so. So I would get this. So I was the only Kohen. It was like a, it was like a minyan of like 30 people. And I was the only, I was the only Kohen. Every, and they hired me to be the Hazan. I was the rabbi and the Hazan. So every single day I did this. I got a very nice tutelage in how to do this. If the Hazan is the only Kohen and he's confident, then he finishes the Beracha and he performs Birkat Kohanim at the spot where he's the Hazan. In some cases, some people, the Hazan will actually leave the Bima and go up to the platform and then come back down. Some places will do that. But it's not necessary. That causes a lot more pageantry. It's a little bit more confusing. It's acceptable to perform Birkat Kohanim from the Bima, from the place where the Hazan right. is. Yeah. Basically performs Birkat Kohanim as he would regularly, right? But you're not saying that, that, that paragraph in advance. No, you're not going to say the paragraph in advance because you're in the middle of the Amidah. The, 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 a side person will call to you Emor, the Kohen will say the Beracha, he'll turn around, it's part of his Amidah, it's not an issue. He'll make the Beracha, he'll turn back around, and then he'll start Sim Shalom and finish the, and, and finish the, finish the Amidah. So that's what's acceptable for, if that's only if the Kohen is the only one, right? I did see, there was one other example. Oh, wait, wait, I saw a Kohen do it when there was many Kohen. Yeah, so there are some people who do that because they want to learn the, the Gemara that if a person is confident all the time, even not when he's the only Kohen, that it's acceptable. But this is not the traditional Psaq Halakha that we offer. I'll give you one exception that I have heard of. I believe, um, I believe it was Rabbi Rabinovich, who was a Kohen, Alava Shalom, very big Tamir Hakam, who we know there's a common practice when a person loses their parent, when a person is in the year for their parent, um, that they like to, what the Ashkenazim call, they, they, they pray from the Amud, they, uh, they, they're Hazen, right? They're, okay, so there's an idea, by the way, even, bef- even, uh, even before Kaddish, by the way, because Kaddish has become the, the prayer of the mourners, before Kaddish, the original institution was that a mourner should be the Hazan, and he leads the kahal in the prayers and in the Kaddish, specifically tefillat arbit. So there was a lot of, really, that it's, there's an idea that people who are in mourning for the year, they act as the hazan for the kahal. But of course, we don't, not everybody's capable of doing that, and we don't want to send people up in a bad position. So anyway, Kaddish is what, is what happened. So um, Rabbi Rabinovich wanted to be hazan, but he was a kohen. So he was going to be hazan for the whole year for his parent, and he was a kohen. So he said, I don't want to lose out. I'm bin Kat Kohanim my whole year while I'm Hazanim. So he wrote a Psaq Halakha that if a person is in their year of mourning and wishes to be Hazan, but he's also a Kohen and doesn't want to lose the Zechut of bin Kat Kohanim for the whole year, he can do it. Wow. That he can do it. And he can, he can be confident and it's acceptable for that. But not, like again, no, meaning even when there's other Kohanim. No, but that's not, so, I understand we've seen it, but that's not the typical Psaq Halakha. So that's why he wrote, for this purpose, it's okay. There, there is room to be lean, but for the most part, that's not the practice that we, uh, that we have. If there's uh, one other Kohen, and you're at the, at the Bima, as the Hazan. Generally, if there's even one other Kohen, then the Hazan does not perform Birkat Kohanim. And the practice is, it's as if there's only one. Correct. In yes. In words. terms of all the other things, there's only one Kohen so blessing. Oh, so one that's it. One yes. can make the argument that you want to do the, the, the Mitzvah de Oraita. True. But we, it's more important, it seems, in this, in this case, to make sure that the rest of the Amidah goes, uh, goes properly. Okay. So just to wrap it up. But just, but just, yeah. just to tell you devil's advocate, you said before, if the Hazan is confident that he can continue on, don't you think more so that when there's two Kohen, one the Hazan and one another person, so the question is, when do we allow that heter of if I'm confident, I could do birkat kohanim? So some people learn the sugad that that heter of confidence only applies when you're the only kohen. So you don't negate the whole mitzvah. But if there's even one other kohen, then we don't, you say, oh, if you're confident, you can do it, you can continue. So there's, there's what's it, but there's the general uh, psaq halakha that's given. So, yeah. I have a question about the kahal. Yeah. I don't know if this is the right time to ask it. Go ahead. Um, the Egyptians cover their son's head. Yeah, we discussed this on Friday. Yeah. Rabia never did it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. now, like a free for all. Some people are doing it, some people are not doing it, some well, people feel better they're not doing it. Shamal Amad do it to his son in the shul. So, I mean, look, uh, the way, the way uh, we've, I've heard Rabbi Luf discuss this question before, 
There is no, there is no makor, there is no source for blessing sons during Birkat Kohanim. It's not brought down anywhere. To, to my knowledge, and if the rabbi says not in his knowledge, that's, that's good enough for me. Um, however, um, it seems as though this is one of those things that just became yeah, widespread. It became a thing. In fact, we noted the, uh, in our previous class that some rabbis were actually against this practice. They didn't like the practice. Why didn't they like the practice? Because it could be mis- misrepresenting the fact that the father is making the beracha instead of the kohanim. There's this idea that potentially somebody could have a, a thought, oh, my father's blessing me, right. not the kohanim are blessing me. So some rabbis were even not only like uh, parv about it, but some people were, didn't like the, the practice. However, this has become a, a, a custom that we've seen rooted within the community that has become more widespread. Um, Rabbi Aluf said he's not ta- against talking out, out uh, he doesn't talk out against the practice, but it's important for people to understand that, uh, I understand, he doesn't talk out against it, he says it's important to understand that it isn't a source, it's more of a, it's more of a emotional thing that developed, that when a beracha is being given, fathers and sons come together to uh, receive the beracha. And besides that, if a person wants to do that, it's fine, but one is not under any obligation to do it necessarily. If it's not your practice or custom, you don't have to observe it. So, so, so tell them, just, just so you know, with accepting the beracha of the birkat kohanim, not the beracha of the father. It's a mystical level where everything, there's like, everything happens down here, so as Hashem is blessing you down upstairs, you're also giving beracha. He's saying like, I'm mimicking the father, whatever it is. But there isn't, but there isn't a source that, that, to that. It's not a problem unless in the eyes of some, <clears throat> when you're we're misrepresenting where the beracha is coming from. In other words, if now by the father standing there putting his hand on the, father, on the child's head, the child thinks that the beracha is coming from his father instead of paying attention to the fact that the beracha is coming from the child, so that could take away from the, from the practice. Right. You like it. It's, it's, a nice, it's a nice bonding moment. I'm with you. That's why I said it's a nice bonding moment. Right, so that's what I'm saying. I think it's a nice it's a nice emotional it's a nice emotional bonding moment. Maybe it maybe it you know what you know what a theory could be? Maybe husband, fathers wanted to make sure their children came to Bet Knesset, so he says, I feel bad when everybody has their child there, I'm not I'm blessing my child. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but I, the problem that I'm having is because it's not uniform, it's as if if I'm not doing it. Oh, I get it. No, so that shouldn't be the case. That shouldn't be the case. If it's not, uh, if it's not something that is rooted in your family and it's not a custom and one is not under any obligation to do it and one can simply explain to their child that there's no basis for it. You give a bit of on Friday night, you give a bit of chan thing. Huh? Yeah, I don't think they put it over. They just kind of like uh, rest their hand on it or whatever it is. Yeah. You guys got to come to the class every day. We talked about this already. <laughs> yeah. Long story. <laughs> long story short. Long story short. We don't look at the Kohanim because we don't want to be distracted while we're looking from the Beracha that they're giving. So very similar to how we say, don't look at the guy who's blowing the shofar because you're going to be distracted looking at him. His face, he's red, he's this, he's that. You're not paying attention to the mitzvah. So the idea is when somebody's performing a mitzvah, you don't stare at the Kohanim because that's going to take away from your opportunity to concentrate and focus on the mitzvah. Is it any sewer? It's written in halakha that, it's, that one should not do so. That's what it's written in halakha, one should not, and mistaklim kohanim. We don't, we don't gaze or stare at the Kohanim when they're performing the beracha. One should be, to, to expand this a little bit, what, what should the kahal be doing when the beracha is being offered to them? They should be closing their eyes, silent, Listening to the beracha, responding amen and baruch hu, baruch shemo when appropriate, and internalizing the, the, the beracha. That's what the kahal should be doing. There is a, there is a concept brought in, uh, brought in the Gemara, in Masechet Berachot, and it's written in some sidurim, that if a person had a bad dream, that the time of Birkat Kohanim, while the blessing is happening, is an auspicious time to pray for Hashem to interpret the dream positively, or that Hashem should make uh, only positive things happen to them. Um, so if a person really felt that need and wanted to use that time, it's brought down by, uh, in, in post scheme that it's an acceptable thing for people to do. However, however, in general, one should refrain from reciting any type of pisukim or verses or anything else while the, while the Birkat Kohanim is going on. Yeah, there's pamphlets that people put out and things like that. Chamu was not in favor of these types of practices. 
he says that one, when the beracha is being recited, one should simply be quiet and focused and listening to receive the beracha. That's the most important thing at that point. The problem is, is that when a person is praying other verses in the middle, he's distracting himself from listening to the beracha. No, but when you're, when you're reciting verses, though, it's hard to be internalizing. What do you mean you're not reciting? You just tell me you're saying... Uh, no, you're, it, it, in other words, you, you're thinking about it. What you should be thinking, thinking and reciting are different. That's why I, I was very clear. I was saying a person should not be reciting any other pisukim, should not be verbally saying any other prayers while Birkat Kohanim is but going on. thinking about each word and what it means to you. Think all you want. Think from here to tomorrow. That's what you should do. You should be internalizing the Beracha and accepting the Beracha. But a person should not be verbally expressing anything else during that time. Hamu Vadiyah has a similar statement when it comes to Tki'at Shofar. Yeah. He says, when the Shofar is being blown on Rosh Hashanah, one should not be saying supplications and forgive me and, and verbally expressing himself. The time for Shofar is a time for quiet introspection and reflection and focus on what's going on. And Birkat Kohanim is a similar point opportunity for that as well. Bezat Hashem, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about the Beracha and other things as well.